Yeah, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. It's uh, it's Wednesday, so it's MNI Day. Um, it's great to see so many people already in, and, and we're getting more and more people coming in. So it gives me great pleasure to uh, to introduce to you today's speaker, Hans Rudi Mara, who's going to be speaking on on the, well, you'll see the title. But I'll, I'll introduce Hans Rudi in a minute, but before I do. Just very quickly to remind you that uh, you can go to the MTNet MNRs page and on that page you'll see upcoming MNRs that you can register for and uh, past MNRs that you can see the video links for and uh, the presentations for. Uh, just a quick mention that you are on a webinar rather than a Zoom meeting, so you can uh, set your audio settings. You, you should see something like this black thing. You can send a a chat message, uh, send a Q&A, please. Put questions in Q&A and then uh, Hans Rudy will answer on the fly or maybe at the end of the webinar. And if you want to speak and we promote discussions, actually at the end of the talk, raise your hand and we'll, we'll allow you to discuss. Uh, but before I introduce Hans Rudy, a, a quick advertisement for next week's MNR, also coming from uh, ETH in Zurich is a, uh, Alexander Graver on uh, three-dimensional anti-modeling and inversion in the spherical Earth applications to continental scale surveys. So today is Hans Rudi Maurer, and I've known Hans Rudi. We were just chatting about it when he first came to Ottawa in '95. So that's 36 years I've known Hans Rudi and followed his very, very successful career, um, particularly the work that he did on um, on survey assessment survey. Um, modeling so a design. Uh, but today Hans Rudi will talk on a really interesting topic, um, helicopter borne ground penetrating radar surveys and alpine glaciers. And uh, very much looking forward to this. Very briefly, Hans Rudi, well, I, I didn't write your CV in here. Normally I have your CV, Hans Rudi. <laughs> Terribly sorry. Um, yeah, Hans Rudi, can you, Introduce yourself. I'll stop the share and you <laughs> briefly tell everybody who you are. Okay. Okay. So, uh, well, uh, before I share the screen, then I'm going to say a few words about myself. So, uh, I'm uh, a seismologist by training, but then uh, after my PhD, which I did uh, many, many years ago, I saw the light and I uh, went to applied geophysics. And uh, in particular, I was dealing with uh, EM techniques, and uh, this was also the reason why I joined um, Alan Jones in, in Ottawa for a few months. And, uh, in, uh, and since then, I've worked uh, on a variety of techniques, so, so through the entire spectrum of geophysics. And uh, it was not only uh, theoretical developments, but also applications. So I, I consider myself as, as an applied theoretician. So uh, we do field work and then we identify problems and we try to find the algorithms that solve these problems. And uh, what I'm currently doing can be broadly divided in three fields. Uh, one of them is uh, studying the cryosphere. So this is what I will talk uh, today about it. But then I'm also quite heavily involved in geothermics. And in particular, we are running a, a deep underground lab where we test these enhanced geothermal systems. And then uh, the third area of applications is uh, nuclear waste programs, uh, where I'm also quite heavily involved. And uh, shall I just start with my presentation now, Alan, or do we want to make further announcements? No, no, please go ahead, Hans Rudy. Okay, so let me see as to whether uh, this is going to work. Okay, can you see my screen in full screen mode? Yeah, ab absolutely perfect. Okay, so I mean, you already heard about the title of my talk. My apologies that it is not MT, but at least uh, it follows Maxwell's equations. So it's about ground penetrating radar. And uh, I really would like to emphasize uh, upfront that uh, I'm just a reporter on behalf of a large group. Some of the key names are indicated here but there are many more contributors from ETH and from uh, other institutions worldwide. So, uh, 
I will uh, talk basically about the following. So first, I'll give a very brief introduction why we are studying glaciers at all, and then uh, give you uh, some instant glaciology, a few important features of alpine glaciers, which are relevant for what I'm going to report afterwards. Before I jump to the main topic, and this is about this helicopter borne GPR surveying, I will spend uh, a few words about data acquisition and then uh, data processing before I jump to the interpretation, what we can actually do out of this data. Before I will show uh, an application to uh, not surprisingly Swiss Alpine glaciers and then finally some concluding remarks uh, where we are going. So why starting Alpine glaciers? So uh, they are all heavily retreating, as you know, and you certainly have seen similar pictures. This is an example from the Bernese Overland in Switzerland. So where we have in 1948 uh, a sizable glacier, glacier, it's called Drift Glacier, and then it is continuously retreating, just leaving this lake in behind. And uh, this has quite a few consequences. One may first say, well, why studying this? Uh, in a few tens of years, they're gone anyway, and then they are no longer a concern. But uh, for the next few decades, they, they actually are. And uh, so one important aspect of it is that uh, it is of uh, great importance for the energy sector. So when, we, uh, when the glaciers are retreating, then uh, there is a loss of water storage at high altitudes. But at least for uh, a few tens of years, for a few decades, uh, there are also opportunities. And uh, one example is uh, shown here with this uh, overall edge glacier. So uh, this part of the glacier, so I hope you can all see my mouse pointer, uh, will be gone in about 10 years and uh, a lake will form. And uh, so this is basically a free uh, hydropower reservoir that you can have. And then at least for some time, uh, you can exploit this. And there are a number of projects in Switzerland that uh, are looking at such opportunities. Then uh, in particular for Switzerland glaciers, there are also a tourist attraction and uh, quite some alpine infrastructure is built on glaciers. and. Uh, some countermeasures have to be taken in order to stabilize this when uh, the ice is uh, melting away. And then finally, the uh, retreat of the glaciers is uh, also associated with uh, quite a few natural hazards. So there are underground lakes or uh, lakes forming within the glacier, and there are lake outbursts, which can create floods. And then also when the ice goes away, uh, the uh, flanks, they become unstable and may uh, result in landslides or rock slides. So there are plenty of reasons why we should understand uh, these glaciers. And uh, this is uh, probably also well known to most of you. So this is how a glacier works. So uh, glacier ice is not really ice, uh, so frozen water, it is compressed snow. And uh, it is, uh, can be considered as a viscous material, which is flowing. And uh, at higher altitudes, there is accumulations through snowfall. And at lower altitudes, where it's a bit warmer, there is uh, ablation. So the uh, ice volume is uh, decreasing. And when there is more accumulation and ablation, then we have advance and vice versa, we have retreat. So it's quite simple. And at the moment, we have predominantly retreat. And, uh, but it is interesting to see uh, how these glaciers move. So uh, there are two uh, uh, mechanisms. One of them is uh, deformation creep, and that's quite um, presently shown uh, with this uh, image on the uh, left. So how this ice is creeping. And uh, but there is also this basal motion, and on the right hand side, uh, you see a video from a glacier, an Argentinier glacier in the Western Alps. And uh, there they were able to uh, install this wheel uh, underneath the glacier, and uh, with which they can actually uh, can measure the basal motion. So it starts again, and uh, so you see that uh, the glacier is not only deforming, but it is also sliding, and it is a little unclear. Uh, which of the two mechanisms is dominating it? It is certainly both, but uh, it is probably glacial dependent which of the two mechanisms uh, is dominant. 
Okay, and then finally, we have so-called cold and tempered glaciers. So uh, cold glaciers, they have basically no unfrozen water in it. And uh, this applies to uh, mostly to the uh, ice caps, to the, to, to the ice shields in the north and in the south. But uh, many alpine glaciers, they are considered as tempered glaciers and they include uh, some inclusions of um, unfrozen water and uh, there are also combination of it. And, but most glaciers that we are looking at uh, are tempered glaciers and this has some important consequences for uh, GPR surveying. And uh, this becomes very clear when we look at the uh, properties uh, or the uh, propagation velocities uh, of GPR in uh, these materials, so in ice. So uh, we have a velocity of about 0.17 and the underlying bedrock has 0.12. So, and this uh, difference is uh, the reason why we want to use this. So this gives a nice impedance contrast such that we see reflections from the bottom and uh, can make these images of glaciers but uh, when we have water inclusions with very low velocities, uh, this includes a large amount of scattering in the ice and therefore it is much more difficult to uh, perform such measurements uh, in, uh, on alpine glaciers. So we often look quite jealously to people working in Arctica and Ant Antarctica where they have these spectacular GPR images from great depths and uh, Due to that, we are often not able to uh, achieve that, but uh, as I will show in the following, uh, we can achieve something. Okay, so uh, this is uh, what's typically done on the ground. So you have a transmitting and a receiving antenna, and uh, as these guys, then you just walk over the ice and uh, continuously acquire data. And uh, in this particular case, uh, this is easy to do, but uh, in many cases, so there are crevasses, it is steep, it is dangerous or uh, labor intense. And uh, therefore uh, it makes sense that uh, we do this not from the ground, but from a helicopter. And we can do this because the uh, GPR antennas are inductively coupled to the ground. So therefore we do not need to have a direct contact and we can do something like this. We just fly with the helicopter over a glacier and uh, measure the reflections from uh, the predominantly from the bedrock, but also from internal features and we can produce images out of it. So let me quickly talk a little bit about the helicopter uh, data acquisition systems. So they can be broadly divided in what we see on the left. These are so-called hanging systems. So this is a system from DGR from Germany. So the antennas are, in, are included in this cage here and the cage uh, provides a little bit of shielding. The advantage of that system is that uh, it basically can be considered just as freight, so as hanging freight. And uh, there, uh, it can be hooked up to any helicopter and uh, you do not need any additional licensing. So you can just bring your system to any place, hook it on a helicopter and you can do your thing. The disadvantage is that uh, you have a little less of control. This thing might rotate and uh, might swing around. And uh, so the distance to towards the helicopter might be a little unstable. So this is important as you will see in one of the following slides. On the right hand side, you can uh, rigidly mount the antennas directly underneath the helicopter. Then the interference with the helicopter will be of course larger, but uh, it is in a more controlled fashion. And uh, an additional advantage of that is that you can land with the helicopter uh, during a survey for doing a quick analysis or, or whatever. Landing here is always associated with uh, a helper at the ground and it is a bit more complicated. So, here we see uh, two example images from the Great Alleged Glacier. So that's the largest glacier in the uh, Central Alps, uh, which is shown here. So these are two uh, profiles that we acquired in the bottom in the ablation part. And you see that the images are not too bad. So, I mean, we uh, see clearly reflections from the bedrock and these are a few hundred meters. And with this, we can then make some ice volume estimates. On the same glacier, we also uh, acquired data in the accumulation zone, and they are shown here. And uh, they are rather disappointing. So we expect that the uh, the thickness of the ice is quite comparable, but we see mostly artifacts. Uh, 
in here. And uh, this is still a bit of a mystery that uh, in uh, some occasions uh, the technique works like a charm and in other occasions uh, we have problems and we virtually do not see anything. And uh, one of the reasons might be certainly the presence or absence of water, but there are also other reasons why, which may cause problems. And one of them I would like to briefly discuss with you. And uh, this is about uh, directivity effects of uh, GPR antennas. And uh, I will explain this by means of an experiment that we have performed a few years ago in the uh, Western Swiss Alps. This is on the so-called Ottema Glacier. So it's a valley-shaped glacier, which you see in here. And we have uh, acquired uh, ground-based and helicopter-borne profiles, coins in profiles, as you see them here. And uh, the uh, interesting thing here is that uh, we changed the direction of the antenna. So uh, we were recording all profiles, either with X-directed antennas. So this means that the antennas are parallel, aligned parallel to the glacier flow, and then also with the Y-directed directed, uh, orientation. And uh, it is known from many other studies or some other studies so that the, uh, the, the direction of the antenna has some effect, but uh, it was came as a surprise to us when we were looking at the differences. Uh, in the next slide, you will see a cross section from the ground based profile uh, that was acquired here, but uh, similar conclusions can be drawn from the remaining profiles. So as, as you see here, so with the X-directed antenna, we get a beautiful image of the reflection of the bedrock. And uh, with the uh, 90 degrees rotated antennas, uh, it almost disappears. And uh, this was quite amazing. And uh, to investigate this a little further, we performed this uh, rotation experiment here. And it is schematically shown here, we were just rotating the antenna around and we're measuring the signals. And uh, here you see the corresponding trace as a function of the rotation angle. And uh, you really can see that you can switch on or switch off the reflection. So, I mean, here it's basically switched off and then when you turn it by about, uh, accordingly it turns on and then you turn it off again. So that's uh, quite amazing. And uh, a PhD student of mine, uh, Lisbeth Langhammer, she uh, investigated this a little more in detail uh, with numerical simulations. And it turned out that uh, this effect is due to the radiation pattern of the antenna in combination with the uh, topography of the, uh, of the reflector, or the topology of the reflector. And the conclusion basically is that uh, you should always record with uh, antennas oriented parallel to the glacier to the glacier flow and that's fine in a situation like this but uh, for example in a saddle area like up here then uh, you do not really know how to measure because it's a little unclear which uh, orientation is best and uh, this motivated the development of a new system that uh, we have done a few years ago and this is the air ETH system and uh, with which we try to uh, address this problem. So uh, here it is uh, shown on the ground. Uh, it includes uh, uh, several components. Uh, most importantly, of course, we have uh, GPR transmitter and receiver antennas. And uh, the, uh, the uh, distinguishing features from other system is that we have uh, two pairs of antennas. We have a transmitter receiver here and transmitter and receiver here so that we actually measure both directions and then we become some sort of independent how the uh, subsurface is looking like. Then in addition to the, that we have uh, three GPS antennas mounted on here with which we can determine not only the positioning but also the orientation so your pitch and roll of the, uh, of the system quite precisely. And then uh, we have uh, everything is contained in the system, so the entire data recording. So there is only a wireless connection to uh, the person sitting in the helicopter. Then furthermore, we have a uh, laser altimeter device with which we can measure the, uh, the distance to the, uh, to the ground. In earlier times, we uh, always did this by uh, analyzing the uh, reflected GPR wave from the surface, but in case of heavily crevassed areas, this is a bit of a problem. 
with this we can do this much more accurately and here you see the entire system in action so these wings they are installed for stabilizing the system such that uh, it doesn't rotate when the helicopter is flying and uh, we did extensive tests and this worked out quite fine so what i would like to uh, share with you is a little bit about the uh, data processing so uh, ground gpr data processing is uh, relatively trivial compared with seismics because we have basically zero offset data and we are using our in-house package for that and uh, on the right hand side you see a uh, pretty standard uh, flow so that uh, you get the data from the field you do some data conversion and then uh, some uh, ringing noise i will say more about that that needs to be removed and then in our case uh, the two channels need to be merged uh, it turned out that simply adding the signals of the two channels uh, does the job then some frequency filtering is required to only maintain the frequencies that are actually transmitted by the antennas then some altitude corrections for accounting for the height of the helicopter need to be done with this fx that convolution so that's a beauty fire so you basically increase the uh, uh, consistency of the reflectors a bit and then traditionally you do a uh, data binning because uh, the helicopter flies only at approximately constant speed and so you, you put this then in uh, equidistant data bins you apply a Kirchhoff migration and uh, you do a time to depth conversion and then you have a section where you can pick the bedrock reflections so uh, for helicopter burn uh, purposes uh, this removal of ringing noise, as I will show next, is quite important. And it also turned out that uh, we need to do something different uh, to this approach down here. So we have applied reverse time migration, and I will uh, show you the principle later on. But let's first talk about the removal of ringing noise. And uh, I show you here the two examples of um, raw data uh, that were acquired uh, over a glacier and uh, you see uh, plenty of nothing or plenty of noise and what you basically see here with these horizontal stripes these are uh, electromagnetic waves that are bouncing force and back between the antenna and the helicopter and uh, so uh, these are two different types of helicopters so that's the older model so the llama helicopter and the echoroid the newer one so the newer one has uh, much more metal on it, so therefore the, uh, the ringing is also more pronounced and uh, clearly uh, there is not much value in uh, such data, but luckily the ringing is quite consistent and it can be removed with appropriate processing. And the, the obvious thing that uh, you need to do is uh, a, uh, uh, oh, or a good solution how to remove this is a so-called singular value decomposition filter. And uh, so again, here is the clipped section. So one single trace out of it. And uh, what we do, we make a singular value decomposition of this. Uh, I mean, that, that's a pretty standard technique uh, that is applied in a number of fields. Uh, so in seismics, it's also referred as the carbon Löw transform or carbon Löw filter. So uh, you basically decompose uh, this image that you uh, consider as a matrix D in uh, these components with the single values in this diagonal matrix in here and uh, the thing is that uh, the uh, the decomposition has uh, so, so it uh, the component that is uh, most common for uh, all traces and these are obviously these horizontal stripes they are all contained in the largest singular value and then uh, when they are sorted by their magnitude so then uh, with decreasing values, then uh, you see the differences. And then uh, a simple solution would see that uh, you're going to simply put the largest eigenvalue to zero and to the back transform. And uh, this works to some extent, but we did it a bit more sophisticated. So uh, this is the single value di uh, distribution for uh, this image here. So you see, indeed, the largest value is extremely high. So it is even higher than this, and then it decreases. And we did a bit of experimenting and it turned out that when we apply a taper such that uh, so the larges are damped and then uh, some weights are applied and we finally have such a spectrum and we replace the original single values here to the back transform 
then we get reasonably good results. So, of course, particularly with the clip data, there is not much information in here, but uh, quite a few signals already start appearing behind this uh, quite dominant ringing noise. So uh, that's an important procedure that you need to apply um, when you have helicopter-borne data, uh, GPR data. So then the second uh, thing is uh, migration. So uh, after uh, applying all the other steps, then your section may look something like that. And uh, you need to migrate this, first of all, when you have uh, scatters, they uh, appear as hyperbolas in such sections, and they need to be collapsed to the original location. And then also the, the dips of these uh, reflectors, they uh, are not in the correct position. And uh, this is typically done with Kirchhoff migration. But uh, there are some assumptions are made, for example, a constant velocity. And uh, in our case, this is not exactly met because uh, the helicopter is at some height and you have an air layer in between. And uh, this may cause some artifacts. But luckily, there is this uh, reverse time migration algorithm around, which is conceptually very simple and uh, quite easy to apply for our purposes. And uh, so I do not know how much you're familiar with reverse time migration, but what you, uh, it is best explained when you look at a point scatter. So just imagine the subsurface here would be just a single point and you would acquire data along this profile. Then you basically would see one hyperbola. And uh, what you then could do is at each location uh, where you have uh, acquired data, you're going to feed in your signal and then you back propagate this in time. And uh, if you're going to back propagate this until time zero, then this hyperbola will finally collapse to a point. And uh, the good thing is that you can take an arbitrary model into account to do this. And in our case, we uh, of course include then the air layer. And this is conceptually shown here so that uh, we have the this is the trace of the helicopter. So we see the, the height is quite variable for various reasons. Down here, we have the ice, which uh, can be considered to have quite a constant velocity. And uh, so this is basically the setup that we use for our reverse time migration. It's also important to note that uh, we have to use only half of the actual velocities because we only do a one-way propagation in our data. The, these are reflection data with zero offset. They uh, have undergone a, a two-way propagation. But everything can be really solved with a single uh, modeling step or with a single type of modeling. And uh, so uh, just to show it when we, so th this is, by the way, one trace that is fed in at this particular point, but of course you do this at every other point as well. And so here you see how it's going to work. So we start with this back propagation in time, and then the image starts appearing. And then at time zero, you're done. So you have your actual image that you would like to have. And uh, if we compare it again, so that's the unmigrated image, that's the migrated image. So we see that many of these uh, scatters here, they have collapsed or have disappeared. And uh, also here, uh, you have a pretty clean image and you're able to pick the uh, bedrock. And then uh, as a next step, uh, you can make an estimate of the ice volume. So, uh, it seems that we are done by now, but unfortunately, this is uh, not yet the case. So, uh, and the problem is the following. So, also, we can, with helicopter borne uh, surveying, we can acquire data quite quickly. Uh, the uh, amount of profiles we are able to record on the glacier is still quite sparse. So, we are unable to uh, acquire unaliased uh, spatial images such that we really can get a a reasonable 3D distribution of the eye sicknesses. And uh, that's a bit of a problem. And uh, you may say, well, then you just interpolate between the uh, individual profiles. And that's certainly possible, but this doesn't really give uh, useful results. And in order to uh, tackle this problem, we need to consider what glaciologists used to do when uh, GPR was uh, not yet available. and. Uh, what they basically did, so they did uh, ice sickness estimates with numerical modeling approaches using glaci glaciological constraints. 
And uh, so uh, I will briefly touch this in the next few slides. And so what you basically need to do, so you look at the, uh, at the topography of the glacier and uh, you need the outline of the glacier. And then you make some assumptions that some uh, flow laws um, are applying. And uh, out of this, you can then make an estimate of the thickness of the uh, glacier at each point. And uh, the advantage of this is that you get then a continuous eye thickness distribution, but uh, of course, uh, you lack ground truth. So uh, there are quite a few assumptions in it, uh, which might be uh, unjustified. And ideally, we're gonna combine this. And this is exactly what we have uh, done in the following. And, uh, let me first uh, talk a little bit about uh, this glaciological ice modeling. So there are many approaches around. And uh, so if you're interested in that, then go to Google and type in ITMIX. So this was a comparison project uh, led by one of my colleagues, Daniel Farinotti, and they uh, compared about 20 different approaches and uh, all of them work to, to some extent. I have chosen to uh, use the uh, algorithm by Gary Clark from UBC. And uh, so uh, with his uh, approach, you basically can determine the thickness uh, of the uh, ice at a particular point by looking at the basal shear stress, tau star, divided by uh, these uh, constants. And uh, here with phi, we have the surface slope. So this is basically the topography and the basal shear stress can be determined uh, out of these quantities. So this is the exponent of Glenn's flow law. So that's uh, one of the fundamental laws how uh, ice is deforming and creeping. And then uh, you have uh, other the, the creep factor, which is also determined empirically. And uh, you have other factors like this xi, which is the creeping contribution. So you may remember the videos I showed to you. So if xi would be equal to one, it would be a uh, uh, poor creeping on the deformation and if it would be zero then it would be sliding that's also quite purely known and then the specific discharge so this is basically how much ice is flowing through a uh, certain uh, area of the glacier so uh, with uh, the help of some empirical laws and constants uh, this can be determined and then you can uh, determine the ice thickness okay so now let's uh, talk about my apologies, there is too much text in it, so you can read it if you like, but you can also just listen to what I have to say. So, I mean, the, the story is relatively simple. So, uh, what we do in our approach to combine GPR measurements with this glaciological modeling, we uh, subdivide the glacier area in, a, uh, in some patches, and it is our goal to determine the uh, ice thickness at each of these patches. And for this, we are using a number of constraints. And the first constraints are, of course, the, uh, the GPR data that we have. And uh, so along each of the profiles, we, we have this data. And uh, these GPR constraints, they can be cast in an equation like this. So HS, so these are the estimated, so that this is what you're after, uh, estimated thicknesses. They uh, are related uh, to the actual GPR data over this matrix G, which is just a diagonal matrix, which has a one for elements where we have data and zero for elements where we have no data. So that's the first uh, type of constraints that we have. Then the second type of constraints are these glaciological constraints. And uh, so uh, when we have access to a digital terrain model and to the uh, outline of the glacier, then we can do this these calculations I've shown here, and we can determine this quantity in here. But uh, as I also mentioned, uh, this might be quite inaccurate because uh, there are lots of assumptions in here. And uh, in the first run, we can improve this by actually make a comparison at the places where we have data, so where we have GPR data, we can uh, set up a minimization problem. So we basically say, uh, try to find the factor alpha, which uh, makes then uh, these uh, glaciological constraints match with the actually observed data. And this can be easily achieved with a line search. And then you determine the factor alpha for a particular glacier. And this already helps. But uh, we still feel that uh, 
is a correct that glaciological constraints still have some adequacies, but uh, what's probably quite accurate are the relative changes of the ice thicknesses, because uh, this goes hand in hand with the relative changes of the topography and the digital terrain models, they are usually quite accurate. And uh, in order to not uh, use the actual glaciological constraints, the absolute values, but only the uh, spatial gradients of it, we're going to define a second uh, set of constraints, which are shown here. So we're going to compute the spatial gradient of the corrected uh, glaciologically modeled uh, thicknesses. And on the left hand side, again, we have our salt quantities. And this is just a different operator in order to account that we are looking at gradients and not actual values. Then there are two more constraints we're going to put in. So the third one, that's quite easy. So uh, as I said, we need to know the glacier outline. And uh, with this constraint, we simply force the, the glacier thickness to be zero everywhere outside of the uh, outline of the glacier. So this can be uh, achieved with uh, such a set of equations. And then finally, it is quite clear that we still have uh, an underdetermined problem and uh, we need to do some regularization and here we do what uh, we always do uh, or often do we follow Occam's principle so that uh, when we have many solutions we choose the simplest one and simplicity is here expressed in terms of smoothness so uh, we have a, a set of constraints uh, so a smoothing matrix with which we require the uh, estimated ice thickness to be spatially smooth so we have now four sets of equations that we can combine to a single system of equation that we would like to solve. And uh, in an ideal world, uh, so there is a unique solution, but uh, of course, uh, some of these uh, constraints, they may even contradict each other and uh, things are inaccurate. So we need to apply some weighting. So uh, how much confidence do we have in the GPR data opposed to the glaciological constraints and so on and so forth. So, uh, determining these weighting factors. So that's now the thing uh, we're going to look up next. And uh, there are certainly plenty of options. I just showed to you uh, how we have done this. So uh, the uh, story goes like follows. So uh, lambda 3, this is the one with the, with the boundary. That's uncritical. So you basically can put any value in here, and, uh, and you're good. But uh, with the GPR data, we uh, have to make ourselves aware that uh, the uh, estimates that we get out of GPR, they uh, are better than nothing, but they, they are not accurate. So they are only accurate to a certain percentage. And therefore, our finally estimated thicknesses, they should only fit the GPR data to the degree that uh, this is within the accuracy that we, that we have. So for example, 5% is a, is a reasonable value. This means that for a thickness of about 100 meters, there is a, an inaccuracy of about 5%. And uh, I judge this to be quite realistic. And then also the relative magnitudes of lambda 1 and lambda 2. So these are the contributions from the GPR data, and from the glaciological constraints. Here we only need to look at the relative magnitudes. And then uh, the smoothest constraints, so they should be kept minimal. So we. It should be tuned such that uh, we just fit the prescribed accuracy of the, of the GPR data. And then, uh, so our approach was as follows. We start off with a very high ratio of lambda 1 to lambda 2. So this means so that uh, the emphasis is clearly on the GPR data, and we have a large smoothing uh, constraint. And then we solve the system of equation, and uh, we will see that the uh, GPR constraints are poorly matched, and then we gradually decrease lambda 4 until the GPR data are fitted within the error range. And then we start playing around by uh, adding the contribution from uh, the glaciological constraints, and we iterate on that until uh, we have a maximum contribution from the glaciological constraints, still fit the GPR data, and have a certain the amount of smoothness in here. So let me show how this is worked and what the effects are for uh, 
a few cases. So I have chosen three glaciers that are located uh, in the Swiss Alps. So this is Mordrach Glacier in the Eastern Alps here. The, that's a typical valley glacier. And then we have Plan Mort, that this is a plateau glacier located uh, here. And uh, then there is a collection of glaciers uh, around the Dome Mountain in the Southern Valley area. So let's start with Mordrach. So uh, uh, by the way, what you see here uh, in red, so these are the GPR profiles that we have acquired um, on, the, on these glaciers. So if you would use only the glaciological constraints already with the calibration that I have uh, explained before, we would end up with an image like this. And uh, if we would do use only the GPR data and just would do a mathematical interpolation and no extrapolation, then you would end up with the image like this, which also doesn't make sense. And actually where we have no data here, then we uh, have no sickness estimates. And that's the solution that came out uh, when we uh, followed the approach that I just described to you. And uh, I mean, it shares, of course, some similarities with these two, but uh, when you look at the differences, uh, they are quite pronounced and therefore it's in our view worthwhile applying this. And uh, similar, similar things can be said for plan mort. So uh, again, so you have quite considerable differences. Uh, also, we have a relatively dense pattern of, uh, uh, of GPR lines on this glacier. And finally, for Dome, so there is a similar story. And uh, here I would like to emphasize uh, also, we try our best to cover everything. There are still uh, unsurveyed glaciers. And uh, if you have no information, we still can rely on the uh, glaciological constraint, which is better than nothing. So, uh, this seems to work quite well. And uh, in fact, uh, I mentioned this ITMIX initiative where uh, the glaciological modeling was uh, compared. So there was an ITMIX 2 initiative uh, where uh, glaciological modeling, including JP GPR constraints, are compared. And uh, our GLADE model was uh, competing in that. And uh, it performed quite well. So we have some, some confidence that what we're doing here makes sense. And uh, therefore, uh, we can now go to uh, the application uh, for the uh, inventory of Swiss glaciers. Why we do this, I explained in the very beginning. So here I just focus on the results and uh, some interesting aspects of it. So uh, we said, well, we have now this wonderful system. So let's survey all the glaciers we have in Switzerland. And uh, we tried hard to do this during the past few years and we almost achieved this. Uh, so there are still the few blue spots that are missing, but most of the glaciers, they are, they, they are covered. And uh, so the uh, amount of red gives you an indication how dense the areas were covered. And uh, then we were applying uh, this methodology I explained to you. And uh, it was an interesting project, uh, very expensive, very long lasting. And uh, the final result is one single number. So what's the actual ice volume in Switzerland. And so, so the result is like this. And uh, but what's uh, equally important is so that the uncertainty is very small. So we could uh, pin this down quite accurately. And uh, here you see uh, our estimate. And uh, it fits relatively well with uh, other estimates. But uh, the advantage here really is that uh, we have a much uh, uh, better accuracy. And of course, then also locally, we have uh, much more detailed results uh, compared to all these other studies. And uh, this was projected on digital terrain models from 2016. And if you extrapolate this in the future, then uh, you see that uh, in 2020, so it again will have decreased quite a bit. And I can tell you that uh, towards 2100, 2100, the uh, most of the ice will be basically gone. And uh, this has uh, important ramifications on the uh, runoff behavior. So uh, here is another example. Once you have this data set available, you can play all sorts of, uh, of games. So I mean, these are the main watersheds in Switzerland. So this is the Rhine River, Rhone River, and the two other rivers. And uh, you can see how much volume of ice are feeding into these systems. And, uh, but what I would like to show to you, and uh, I think this underlies the importance of uh, 
accurate ice estimates uh, with uh, this graph here. So this is a study that uh, was performed in the so-called Mobosan area. So that's a glacialized area sitting uh, here in the Western Swiss Alps. So it feeds a uh, filling reservoir. And uh, in order to uh, plan for uh, future hydropower use, uh, people are interested in future runoff behavior. So how much water uh, will they have in the future? And as I indicated in the beginning, so it will temporarily increase, but then it will decrease. But uh, so the uh, temporal uh, evolution is quite important for the planning. And uh, if we would use uh, one of these modeling approaches, you would end up uh, with a uh, runoff prediction shown here in green, which would basically say somewhere around 2045, we will have a peak and then it will decrease and we have quite a large runoff. If we're going to use the methodology that I've shown to you, then we end up with the blue curve. And uh, so it indicates so that the peak will be reached quite soon. And uh, we also did some sensitivity analysis. What if uh, our estimates are 20% too small or too large? And so this gives you uh, the range. So I think we are better, much better than that. But uh, this basically should uh, underline the importance of it because uh, this has important consequences uh, on uh, future projects as to whether you have the maximum here or only later on. And uh, finally, with uh, all these investigations, we could also identify uh, so-called overdeepenings. And uh, these are places uh, where uh, future lakes will form because we uh, get uh, quite a, a good estimate of the underlying topography of the bedrock under the glaciers. And uh, so uh, here are maps of potential over deepenings. And again, this is compared with earlier studies. And uh, the somewhat disappointing news is that uh, the volume of these over deepenings seems to be uh, smaller than uh, uh, it was uh, originally thought of. So by the way, so this is the area around Zermatt, so with the Matterhorn being somewhere down here. Okay, so uh, I have shown to you what we have done during the past uh, 10 years, I would say. And uh, now uh, I would uh, like to use the remaining few minutes uh, to talk a bit on the, on the future of uh, GPR on glaciers. So uh, I have shown to you that we can efficiently acquire sparse profile of data and get this uh, bedrock or this ice volume estimates. But uh, for studying internal structures, uh, it would be really cool when we could have unaliased uh, real 3D GPR data. And uh, in the framework of a PhD project, this is the project of Greg Church. We have actually done this of a relatively large area of the Rhone Glacier, which is uh, located in central Switzerland. So uh, in that area here, we have uh, conducted a comprehensive 3D survey with a very small uh, line spacing and uh, it took forever, but uh, as you will see in a minute, so the results are quite spectacular. And uh, of course, there was a reason why we did this. So uh, from other measurements, we knew that uh, there are some internal structures in it. So uh, some um, flow passes within the glacier. And uh, so this was the target of this investigation. And with this, we really would wanted to delineate uh, the internal flow passes uh, in the glacier. And uh, what we are looking at it now are uh, so-called the depth slices. So you see this schematically here. So this is the 3D volume of GPR data. And in the following movie, we are now moving down through the entire volume and we're gonna look at uh, some features. So at the moment, so at the level where we are at is uh, most of uh, the volume is still in the air. So only at higher altitudes, so we see the, uh, the surface topography. So uh, see that's the glacier surface. So I mean, that's not yet interesting. Then uh, we are going further down. And then uh, you see on the right hand side that uh, the valley flank uh, coming in here. So, uh, so how it is uh, going down. And uh, then, so this is uh, what's uh, really exciting. So this is this drainage network. Uh, that uh, we could uh, delineate with our 3D measurements. And uh, I mean, 
in my view, so I really like this data. I'm a big fan of it. So I mean, uh, so uh, we could uh, determine quite unprecedented details, uh, the geometry of this uh, drainage network down to the lake down here. And uh, so let's finish the movie. So to deeper levels, so we really see how it goes out. And then finally, we also spotted a few over deepenings uh, uh, in the bedrock area. So uh, in addition to that, uh, we actually also did uh, some uh, time lapse measurements in the area up here with just a few selected profiles, and we could identify so the uh, annual behavior of these drainage networks, and uh, that's also a key factor for understanding the mechanisms of of glaciers. But uh, as I said, you can do this in the framework of a PhD project, but I mean, uh, the uh, amount was, uh, of work was uh, quite amazing. And uh, therefore, we feel that for doing uh, such surveys, uh, we uh, need to automate this. And uh, drone based surveying is probably the way to go. And uh, we were lucky enough that we could get a prototype uh, of a drone based uh, GPR system and could actually test this. Uh, on that on that area that I have shown uh, to you before, and uh, so I mean it is a much lightweight system, and uh, with the drone you're much faster. So uh, as I said, with the uh, in the Vulcan mode, a crew of a few people it took them nine days to acquire this, and in principle you can do this with a drone in seven hours. Uh, I say in principle there are still a few technical or many technical problems to be solved. So uh, one main thing are the batteries that are draining quickly. So after 20 minutes you have to recharge batteries. So uh, we are not yet there, but uh, so this is what we hope to do in a foreseeable future. And uh, so also the data quality is uh, not yet where we would like it have to be. So I mean that's the glacial conduit that you've seen before. You, you could spot that the reflection also the bedrock is here. So this is just a single profile. So uh, the uh, more traditionally acquired data are still considerably better, but we hope that we can improve uh, the quality that it, it becomes comparable to uh, what you have seen in my talk. And that's about it. So I hope uh, you enjoyed it and uh, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take your questions. Oh, thanks very much, Hans Rudy. That was absolutely fabulous. <coughs> really did, <coughs> really did enjoy the the quality of data you're able to get these days. That um, that river system that you showed was, was spectacular. Just just a quick question from me before before we uh, jump to the the serious questions. Why is it possible to think about instead of having a single drone you have a swarm of drones let's say ten thousand drones and you just have these as receivers and then you fly over this swarm that sort of land in place then you fly over with a, a transmitter and uh well i mean this would then basically result in multi offset data there is some benefit of it but uh I personally feel that uh, the zero offset measurements where you have nearly coincident transmitters and receivers uh this is probably still the way to go However, what you just mentioned, uh, we were uh, thinking about uh, such concepts uh, for inductive EM, and uh, there it actually would make a lot of sense when you have uh, a large number of drones with uh, loops uh, being there so that you can vary uh, distances and frequencies or even having a transmitter on the ground or something like that. For such measurements, I think uh, this would be quite good. Uh, I would have to reflect a little more on uh, what would be the advantage of uh, several drones and doing GPR, mm -hmm. but at the moment, uh, so uh, I still, uh, I hope that we can solve it for, for a single drone. So that's already a big endeavor. So we have a couple of questions in. Um, I, I'll read the question out so that it gets into the recording. Uh, the first one is from Pavel Alexandrov. Um, is the principle of reciprocity fulfilled when the ground penetrating radar rotates 180 degrees? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So, I mean, it's the reciprocity, I mean, that you could exchange transmitter and receiver, and uh, this, this is unaffected. So, uh, this still holds. Yeah. yeah and uh, we have uh, Michael Christofsen. Uh, how much of an issue is 
clutter from valley walls, etc. What frequency does your radar operate at? Uh, that's uh, so. Oh yeah, th 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 that's a good point. I forgot to mention that. So we are operating at the 25 megahertz with uh, our system, and uh, so that's basically the lowest frequency that uh, we can use with uh, a, a reasonable size of the antennas. And uh, but it is scalable, so we could go to higher frequencies. We basically could hook up uh, any system on it. And you may have recognized uh, we are using a standard sensors and software uh, antenna. So uh, any antenna would be good for that. And then the clutter from the sidewall. So uh, this is indeed a bit of a concern. So I mean, first of all, uh, you uh, when you when you fly, so you know where these rock faces are, and uh, so every now and then you you see the side reflections, and typically they can be identified quite easily, but uh, not always. But uh, so typically they can be identified easily and removed. So, I mean, when you have a digital terrain model, you could even uh, model the occurrence of such uh, flank reflections. And uh, finally, so I mean, when you're in the mountains, then uh, these valley flanks, they look amazingly steep. But when you look at them in a the profile, then they are often not as steep as uh, and intimidating as, as they appear. And uh, so therefore, uh, the reflections are not always a problem, even when uh, one might think there are problems. OK, uh, Nazif Onaral is asking, uh, I was wondering to improve load capacity of the drone to carry bigger GPR antennas. Is it possible to use more than one drone? I saw a couple of studies that they were trying to combine more than one drone. Thank you. OK. Uh, yeah, my might be certainly possible, but uh, I really feel for this uh, glacial survey, so the payload is uh, basically uh, governed by, by the batteries. So, I mean, you need to be able to fly for a few hours and you need quite large batteries. And uh, I was looking a little bit into, uh, well, uh, I mean, so it, it almost goes to a small helicopter. So, I mean, these are all um, electrical drones, but there are also fuel driven drones. And there the payload can be uh, increased quite a bit to 20 to 30 kilograms. And uh, this offers new opportunities. And uh, we uh, may consider one of these systems, but with the uh, with the actual system, it, it might be a bit problematic. So the GPR part is really not a problem because when you strip off everything what is not required, the housing and everything, you end up with uh, plenty of nothing, just a few wires. But as I said, the batteries are the problem. Uh, and Andrea Vagana. Bagnano asks, I was very interested in the methodology for constraining glaciological models with GPR data. Is there a publication? Oh, yes, it is. So I didn't mention it. Uh, so uh, just send an email to you and uh, I mail you the PDF. Uh, my apologies. There was a, uh, a paper published in the Christ here in 2019, I think. Just shoot an email to me and I send you the publication. Okay. Is there any more questions from? audience uh, members. I don't think so. So I guess uh, thanks again very much, Hans Rudy. That was super illuminating. And, uh, and yeah, these are, these are MNRs. So we do everything about EM. EM, it's not just MT, it's EM. <laughs> so, and sometimes not, yeah, not even EM, something else as well. Great. So, um, unless we've got no more questions. Oh, yeah. Douglas Morrison is asking, can we get the slides? And what typically happens is that the speaker decides whether whether to make the slides available. And if if Hans Rudy agrees, then the 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 presentation will be available on the MTNet uh, MNR site together with the recording. The, once I get the recording from. Um, from Zoom, and sometimes it takes an hour, and sometimes it takes three days. It'll be up on the MTNet's uh, MNR site and also on the MTNet uh, YouTube page. So what, what I can do, I will create a PDF out of it. I mean, of course, it yeah, will not please. include the movies, but uh, for the movies for uh, the uh, creeping and sliding, so I indicated yeah. the source, and uh, you can go there and download yeah, the, that's the way to do it. Yeah. Great. 
Well, thanks very much, everybody. And uh, next week, uh, we have another person from ETH speaking um, a couple hours earlier. And uh, Max, I think you're going to be the host uh, next week, right? Well, I'm hoping to be on field work. So oh, right. <laughs> Maybe it's me again. <laughs> okay, everybody. Well, thanks again, Hans, Hans Rudy. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you for your attention. Yeah.